This is Big Man Tyrone, and you're about to watch the MTG Cabal cast with your hosts, Wode, Thirsty, and Reptar. Sub to us on all your podcast networks at MTG Cabal Cast and YouTube. All right, guys, welcome to the newest episode of the Cabal Cast. We've got kind of an interesting topic. Uh, while there's a little bit of a lull in news today, we're basically taking a look at sealed product timelines, specifically mm -hmm. for standard sets. Yes. So when orders happen from vendors up to pre-release, up to release, up to rotation, yes. and what that looks like in terms of what you can expect under normal circumstances, obviously with the release delay for Ikoria, probably thrown off a little bit here. Yep. And but... That's where we're at. Yep. Uh, so that's actually why we wanted to bring it up because of the pushback in uh, Ikoria release. Right? Everything's going to yeah. be offset by a month, so we might see a difference in uh, both single and sealed prices moving forward. Not moving forward immediately, but let's say around the nine to twelve month range. You know, halfway yeah. through this. Uh, this is the spring set, so that three quarters of the way through this set's uh, life cycle in standard, we might start to see something interesting happen with sealed and single prices if everything yeah. is changed as we uh might expect so to give you guys an idea of what we're working with and we're going to toss this up uh where we can in the notes because this is actually a pretty interesting image that we were able to put together this is uh the shorthand of what a standard set lifespan looks like from what we are terming zero day up through rotation yeah uh, and it's worth noting that this is basically gathered, uh, you know, we gathered this from information talking to other vendors, what it looked like for them over the past few years, with some exceptions occurring along the way with sellouts, mm -hmm. uh, because Wizards doesn't actually disclose any of this information. So this is just, like, they don't explicitly state it anywhere. This is yep. just feedback from distros and other vendors, what we kind of put together to help everyone out. Yeah, so. yeah. Up note, we don't have uh, a real standard uh, LGS style timeline on this in regards to where allocation and begins and ends for uh, that kind of thing. We're just looking at larger uh, entities and what they work with because yeah, they oftentimes get preference. Uh, they do. In fact, there's while um, some. Some distros have started closing down. For example, Southern's down to one warehouse. They're giving a little bit of preference to the bigger orders because they enable them to actually pay bills mm -hmm. when they have capacity of one warehouse to do everything. So, Exactly. So uh, if we, we want to start all the way on the left, we can start pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, what, we, what we termed was uh, day zero. Effectively, this isn't when the set is named. This, uh, this is when vendors themselves get to actually put in their order to yeah. distro so this is effectively you know the birth of a standard set so to speak and this is you know again this is standard sets and this doesn't count your supplementals which have a little bit of a different timeline as we note on the image you can have a month to a month and a half which was the case with ultimate masters when they dropped that they were yep. just like here you go you've got a month figure it out Mm -hmm. uh, and then supplemental products the same way, especially the way they've been doing them now with like two to three months lead time. It's kind of all you have. So you've got generally day zero, and we've got it divided into five major points. So day zero is vendor orders, and that's usually three to six months before pre-release. Now that sounds like a big window because it is. So on some of the stuff, like core sets, the window's a little bit bigger because you know it's coming, you know mm -hmm. what the setting is, you don't have to wait for spoilers. Yeah. Um, you can just place your order and go. Whereas some of the stuff like War of the Spark, they held off orders, then they made orders, and then a month after that they said, oh wait, there's Japanese walkers in them, you've already been allocated your stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's some stuff that works in there. Um, and that's, that's basically where we start at is at day zero, three to six months out, vendors place their orders and then go from there. Yep. And then uh, we noted on here that oftentimes in the, the first few months is where you will wind up with a distro leak here and there. And what that comes down to would be things like the, the rivals of Ixalan sheets, uh, the foil yeah. sheets walking out of distro and being s photographed and sold. And the Theros Beyond Death boxes being photographed and leaked that uh, named Elspeth as a character on the side of the box. Um, yeah. Is, 
the we weren't able to pull those up before uh, the episode today. We'll see if we can find them, but it, it's it's not too damning evidence, so to speak. Something yeah. um, prior to that by years was shadows over Innistrad packs leaked out of Distro Warehouse in Europe and were sold on the open market with a about a day. Yep. time on the auction that pack was ripped and we knew immediately what three of the four or three of the five mechanics were from that singular pack yeah. so this is oftentimes where uh leaks do occur in this kind of fuzzy zone and then yeah. we move through and uh we look at uh, there's a big chunk of time here it's the biggest chunk really in the, these first three to six months but backing that off by about two weeks this is something we try to figure it out uh, the second printing wave is uh, either started here or is really just the conversation begins here about whether or not Watsi's going to put in that second order immediately to Cardamunda. It, yeah. It's they've got to you know prime the presses at some point, and as best as we could figure out, this is when that really begins, and we know that that second wave is going to happen. Watsi can can say like we will uh, be sending more out. This will happen. Yeah. Yeah, a week after that, a week prior to pre-release is when the first wave of printing arrives at Distro for disbursement, and then, you know, a couple of days later, it's at your LGS for pre-release. Yeah. And that is... And, oh, and sorry, it's, it's worth noting there as well that the first wave arriving a week prior to pre-release, it's during that entire week that the product starts to show up at local stores. Uh, or at distros. So some distros may get it on Monday if they're in the Pacific Northwest. You may get it closer to Friday if you're down in the Southeast, down in Florida or New York or somewhere like that, just depending on what your distro supply line looks like. Yeah. So it's not like one week prior, everything's there. It's during that week, it arrives at distros. Mm -hmm. Sorry, continue. That's fine. Um, and that basically leads us into you know, our, our pre-release. This is basically the most active time in the lifespan or the life cycle of a standard set is this first block of time. Yeah. That, because that's where, you know, everything happens. Even with supplementals, this is what's going to dictate whether or not you're going to need that second printing. And if you're going to need it sooner than later, how big it needs to be, etc. Yeah. After that, things cool down a little bit and you'll see there are really only a few markers moving out of release that next Friday, regardless of who you are, whether you're an LGS or you're a large vendor like a Channel or Troll or Star City, etc., that Friday, that re that release Friday, that's your reorder window for yep. a re-up on what you have. That's not second wave. That is, if Distro has additional stock from, uh, from first printing, then you can order. There might be blackouts there where the product is so hot they can't allocate as much or you can't order right then because they need to figure out what's going on. But that's the next big thing. Uh, we we noted, and it took a while to kind of suss this out, I remember trying to get new Phyrexia and that sold out. Yep. Uh, but like uh, there was no more allocation for new Phyrexia at that release and a reorder date. Gone. Um, sold out for about two months actually so the second print run on that was as you can see it takes about a month after that the full second wave is out now dom it took a little bit longer and for those of you that remember there was a delay of a war restock because they had to stop printing the set to print a bunch of apology foil sheets for yes. people since they messed up the mythic edition so bad so yet again, another indication of, you know, this is a general timeline, obviously stuff can change it. Yeah. But after that month, that's when you start to get your second wave. That's when you'll go into your LGS and they'll have a couple cases that they didn't have the week prior. Yep. And at this point is typically, uh, so you, about a week after that second wave, your LGSs are stocked. That's typically when you start to see sealed product enter unallocated space. At that point, it's first come, first serve. You can buy as much or as little as you want. Mm -hmm. They're not going to restrict you on it. Now, obviously, Wizards allocates your pre-release and your release pretty heavily. Uh, that Your distro, based on the size of your business, like Star City, Channel Troll, those type of places, do get more feedway. You know, they'll order four to 500 boxes for release just to order, just to crack for singles. And you'll start to see second wave hit. Those guys can get whatever they want, but if the LGS has the money, all of a sudden your LGS can buy 400 boxes yes. as well. Yep. Uh, the, sorry? That, that date is also kind of interesting too. Uh, as I was 
building this list and, and like QAing it, uh, there are, there's an, a note that somebody put out that uh, from a whiteboard video, if you were to track sealed and standard singles through this timeline, you'll see right around that date is when things start to pull up and the market actually return to normal. Things kind of rubber band back and the, and the market kind of cools down and prices really solidify. We were in a race to the bottom because players got all their product. They got what they needed, uh, early winnings, etc. The market's flooded with individuals. And then as, as some of that supply is just naturally drawn out of the market, prices actually begin to norm normalize. And you'll see those cards that don't just spike all the time. They just kind of ride a, a single number. They'll hit that number right in there. So if you're looking at something, you know, like Steamkin came out of the gates really hot. It was great. It yep. tanked. It, it fell off. And it did kind of come back. And this basically holds true no matter where you are in the cycle in the year. Each standard set is in standard for a certain amount of time, 24 to 15 months, depending on where it is in the year. But it is that, like, 60-ish like days or so after release, plus or minus, where things just kind of, like, ride out and eventually kind of market correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also worth noting that this is when you'll see a lot of stuff start to cool. Like, conversely, you'll see a lot of stuff start to cool off, yep. like your uncommons, common stuff like that. Because at this point, you've kind of reached, like, your peak singles crack. Yes. And anything else coming into the market is going to be from drafts. Uh, at this point, you're not really just cracking packs for the cards you want. You'll play drafts and stuff. But after about a month or two, nobody else is opening packs for singles anymore. Your vendors aren't, and they're honestly the biggest ones that affect that market. Yeah. Uh, so that's when you start to see this stuff kind of tank and cool off if it's not that playable. And that's the opportune time to buy for, like, your EDH staples and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, we do have exceptions all the way through. You look at something like World Wake, which is going to be cracked forever until Jason yeah. Mind Sculptor was banned. Conversely, you, can, you look at something like Gate Crash, which did have all four printings allocated to it and just couldn't be moved. The set was uh, just... sat there forever. The set was just so bad in comparison to everything going on around it in Standard that it just sat there. Uh, Fate Reforged was another one I tried to look into. I know, like, going into that summer, because Fate Reforged was a winter release, so we're talking, like, six, uh, seven months later, uh, I was at Anime Expo, and we actually lost money on Fate Reforged boxes, so we didn't have to bring them home from L.A. Yep. Like that, that, that's after that period. We talked about where things kind of normalized. Fate Reforged, also, another one of those sets, just super clunky. I don't know yeah. if we got the full four uh, print run, or uh, print waves, but... Because that one was a little harder to track down. It's not terribly public that compared to the others, were a little more egregious in, in both directions. But from, yeah, from here things are pretty smooth sailing in regards to the life cycle standard. You you figured it out. Things are either like par for the course, or you have a handful of outliers, and then from there things just kind of cool down, and the sets just ride into the sunset, so to speak. You know, a couple yeah. months out, starting with the third wave, it is uh, constant supply everybody it doesn't matter who you are it's just constant supply you order what you can whatever distro has yeah you know um dom They've got it yeah um dom missed the fourth oh, yeah, wave yeah, dom... printing so that that's yep. another one to be to look at as well where it came up short and it was short hit shorted in the long run that's why all of a sudden dom boxes got really expensive because there were just no more and they were not making anymore they watsi felt when it came time to allocate the resources for that last print wave at Carta Monday that it was better for them to push another standard set through something new coming up, a new product of some sort, be it a standard set I might have misspoken or a supplemental, as opposed yeah. to Dom, which they thought yep. was a set that was cooling because it was kind of, you know, mediumly received over that sum well, like throughout that summer. All the sealed events, all the magic fests that you that you and I are at, everything we covered leading into Modern Horizons kind of pointed out that Dom was just as like eh, set. Yeah, it wasn't like... It, and the thing was, it sold so well because of nostalgia, uh, which is an interesting facet, obviously not super related to the topic, uh, but it was interesting that we had a set that could sell so well strictly because of nostalgia. I thought that was great. Yeah. Uh, but that's it, it's worth noting that their full capacity still could not keep up with demand for that set because it shows that if the set is good enough, if it sells well enough, that 
again, it just proves that this timeline doesn't necessarily affect things because the exceptions can be very great. Yes. At that time, I think Hero of Dominaria was like a $60 to $70 card for a couple weeks Yeah, you know, the only deck that could really kind of keep up with Holgak was Blue was Azor Control that basically just played Settle the Wreckage and a lot of, like, uh, condemned yeah. style effects. So you could just keep resetting Hogak. Uh, every time they entered combat, Cell would clear out the zombies, and like, and and uh, Teferi Hero of Dom was a huge part of that. And outside of yep. that, I think it started seeing a little bit of legacy play as well. Miracles wasn't a deck, so to speak, but you could still run it as a one or two of. But yeah, no, no, yeah, that card ran hot for a very, very, very long time in in modern and in standard. Uh, it's just one of those things where they they felt that switching gears and putting that set back in print was not going to do them any favors compared to what was coming up. Uh, through yeah. the rest of the year and you know it, it is what it is it, it happens and you know they have they do have an economist or two there that, that do look at this and they forecast and who knows that was most likely the correct decision pumping out more boxes of dom at that point when people were just kind yeah. of like super blase about that set compared to modern horizons and the upcoming large events that it just made more sense yeah uh, the other thing worth noting in this diagram, and we have it in the bottom right-hand corner, is basically under the current rotation window, how stuff works yeah. in terms of when it rotates for standard. Uh, dividing into the four sets that matter, assuming they're all standard sets, obviously, since non-rotating doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, the fall set's 24 months after initial printing, winter set is 21, spring set is 18, and the summer set is 15 months after the first printing. Yep is when it rotates yeah and if you want to take a quick look at that uh you can check i think it's what is in standard i believe it's yeah, dot com is... and um uh, clicking through any one of the set names there will take you to the scryfall page that tells you when that set was released and you can just boop, look at the numbers and yep. compare so yeah it's what's in standard.com and it'll tell you what stuff is releasing when and everything yep. so yeah, and, and that's how we got to those numbers before this, because that's also really important to know. So wh what this comes down to and where this timeline really affects Sikori is that by the time, uh, you know, Region 1, which is North America, South America, and, and a handful of uh, European nations get the Sikori product, we will effectively be at a point in this timeline where the second wave, in theory, should be at distro when everything's pushed off. Because remember, the set should have released a week ago, around April 14th, Instead, we'll be getting it a month later, uh, around May 14th. So we're already pushed back an entire release wave for this. Yep. So WASTI has to act quick if they want to get the second wave out based on pre-orders. You know, the, uh, we, we noted that they have, is it three or four standard sets in print at any given time at Carta Monday? Uh, it's three. Okay. So basically, they have the capacity <laughs> to have three in print. Now, the thing that's worth noting is there's actually a way to figure out when the stuff goes out of print by paying attention to the market, and that is GoatBot's set redemption, because or just set redemption in general. When set redemption mm. stops at Wizards of the Coast, they don't have excess print, and they're pretty much done. So one of the things they do for set redemptions is they literally just print the sets off, and then what sets they have, they send out. Yep. So when they stop that. set yeah. redemption on Moto, it means the set's out of print. And that's one of the easiest ways to figure it out because your distro may still have some and wizards may still have some at their warehouse that just hasn't sent out in the case of something like gate crash that just mm -hmm. doesn't sell. But once it's out of print, that's when if things are cheap, not that I would ever suggest investing in sealed because due to print runs, it's a garbage investment now. Yeah. Unless you, uh, unless you plan to buy infinite, you have to yeah. buy a huge quantity to make that worthwhile. And unless you do that, like, if, if you were to do that, that would be the time to get in. Because there is typically a lull between the end of set redemption and when distros are finally like, all right, well, we're kind of running out of this stuff now. Yep. And that's your window to get in. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, and if, if you're an LGS that just wants to stockpile it for stuff, perfect time to do it. Yeah. Because at that point, you might not get some appreciation right away on singles and stuff, but it doesn't necessarily hurt you too bad. No. Uh, but, yeah, no, the... I, I totally forgot about set redemption because I don't play Moto, and I, I honestly thought they turned it off. 
uh, yeah. somewhere in Amonkhet. So that, that's definitely good to keep in mind. A lot of people just go with the rule of thumb. What it was is like up to 15 months after a set release, it is in theory still in print. After that, it is it has been cut loose. And that, that's a good rule yeah. of thumb. It's easy. But if you want to get more technical, that's definitely the way to look at it. Uh, looking at the graph, though, and what we, or the timeline, rather, and what we expect from Akoria, I actually think we might be shorted a print wave. I, don't, I think everything gets pushed back. And essentially, the second wave becomes the third. The third becomes the fourth, and we might come up short unless, for whatever reason, they've been able to get Carta to just keep printing at this point in time, and backlog yeah. a third wave. Yeah, and that's that's kind of why we wanted to cover this because this is an opportunity where looking at the normal print run, we may not actually get a normal print run on this set. Yeah. Obviously, Wizards hasn't said, and I don't think they're going to say. Hey, by the way, guys, we're done. You know, we're short a print run because, again, faith-based economy that may make things look not great. But you can at least pay attention and try to see what's at distros, what's at LGSs, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, just to see, all right, well, maybe we did miss a print run. Maybe long-term Aquarius singles are way more viable than any recent set because of that. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely agree. This is going to be a set that's going to be fairly polarizing in regards to, okay, I'm casual and I want to keep a box or two around because that's just the, what I do. If coming out of this into paper, regardless of how long it takes to get there, they start banning companions, then I think a lot of the value of this set is lost immediately because they have picked yeah. up a ton of slack. A yeah. ton of slack. Uh, you know, we, I talked about Luris last week, and that card is over ten dollars now because it showed up in Modern and Legacy. The Boros Companion showed up in Legacy Bomberman because it reduced the CMC of everything in there by one color, so it just fits the bill perfectly. Um, we have Guy Ruda tearing it up in all formats because yeah. people haven't figured that one out, despite the fact that Legacy Leagues had to be taken down because of that card. Uh, there was just a, a bad interaction. Things were not working as they should have, so whilst he had to take down the Legacy Leagues. If those cards get cut out from underneath the game, then a core of, if they leave the bad ones and cut the good ones, then Akoria loses a ton of value because that's where a lot of it's sitting right now. We don't have yeah. a lot else going on. Those cards came in and just immediately took over formats. You know, Broodmoth is just doing a whole lot of nothing right now, and in Standard, people are actually still playing the Gyruda mill deck because you have spark double and a handful of other ways to just clone the deck. Sorry, yep. clone the card, mill yourself out, and then cast off as Oracle <clears throat> to win. Uh, people are people are also mucking around with fires and wilderness reclamation, but a lot of that is just kind of more of the same. It's not a lot of iteration of what we saw. Yeah. There's been some intrigue and pioneer in things like Brood Moth because you can play that in the Heliod combo deck and it gets a little more robust, but overall we're just not seeing a lot yet out of Akoria in these older formats. The, yeah. the Triomes, as expected, are not popping up anywhere outside of standard and people aren't really sure how, how many of them they should be running. So the value that the EV on those cards was probably somewhere between five and ten dollars, which is a rather wide range. But if nobody is adopting them, then that probably shifts to three to five, and that's a more condensed range, which is a lot easier to understand, but also a more appropriate range for a card that's currently in print is going to be in print for the next you know twelve-ish months, provided. Yeah. And we should provided. be fairly well stocked on them for EDH players. Yeah. Uh, and. Interest also of note, it's been, I think Kaladesh was the last set where EDH cards didn't start spiking until after the set rotated. You started, excuse me, you started to see that spike happen a little bit sooner in Aether Flux. Yep. Or sorry, uh, Aether Revolt. Um, so it's, okay, yeah. it's been interesting to see how that's been going. And it'll be interesting to see again. I think three to five is right for that. I think that's, if you can pick it up for three, free pick do so yeah uh yeah i don't know I, I this is just going to be kind of interesting to follow to see how people really take to this set and what's going to happen uh toward let's see towards the summer of 2021 that is where Aquaria will begin to will notice rather quickly if Akoria missed the fourth print wave. Yeah. That's where Dom, like, 
the that summer uh, towards the end was where Dom started to pick up before the fall rotation, and that's what we'll, what we'll see with uh, Acoria. Yeah, I'm just looking through this. Fiend Artisan is thirty three dollars. Brood Moth is twenty five, and then it drops fairly quickly to ten. Yeah, but a lot of these are Luris is in the top five. Outside of that, Gyruda. Like. And then the Triumphs, like I said, sitting around ten dollars on stocks, yeah. and then that's it. They round up like somewhere in the top ten is it begins the slew of ten dollar cards. We're not seeing a lot right now, and a lot of this is just kind of unproven tech things that just hold value because they're planeswalkers. You know, yeah. Um, Rael is going to swing one way or the other. A lot of people view that as a wild card. It will either be really good and is a Phoenix decks, or it'll be a bulk mythic, and we'll kind of see what shakes out there. But this is definitely something we're going to. We're going to keep our, our eye on because if the value moves to companions and companions get cut out, then the set is effectively worth, n- you know, nothing. We lose nothing. Yeah. The further you dig down that list, you'll probably see in the top twenty or the majority of the rest of the playable companions. If they're not there now, they will be by end of week, and then when they go, that's it. Your top ten is basically just you know eight to twelve dollar cards, and then three twenty five dollar cards. Yeah. Which is, uh, it's all on mythics, so it's a little it, difficult. It's- all in mythics and as they've been making more and more sets where it's like okay here's a gimmick card well yeah the gimmicks are the financial driver then and once those are dried up everything else sucks and we've seen it with standard for the last year now yeah and we still don't have paper for another three weeks so those prices are just being set by vendors and best guess by the time players start cracking those boxes that's where the that's where the sets value is really going to start to to drop as people race to the bottom look to recoup and then we'll start seeing that real price come in right now everything's just inflated for multiple reasons so it is it you should be able to figure out that you're not going to make your ROI back on these boxes the day you get them. No way. Yeah. Not with three twenty-five dollar cards or four twenty-five dollar cards, and when the rest is tens, it's just not going to happen. And I, I don't think the moment, like I said, the moment those companions go and the triumphs just are revealed for what they are, the set just loses. Yeah. But um, again, we'll have this the timeline put up in both on both the pod and on YouTube, so you guys can reference it. But uh, you go yeah. for picks. Yep, let's do it. All right. Uh, I'll go first because i got an EDH card. Sure. Uh, my pick for this week is Stryonic Resonator. So Solid. I, I thought it was a good card when it came out. It's a it's a different Rings of Bright Hearth, which is an over $40 card right now, and it's just a, a solid EDH playable. What I like about it partly is the recovery in the price graph, as you can see. Um, it, it Every dip it had is because it saw a reprint of some sort but then it just bounced back it was five dollars prior yeah. to um so m20 masters 25 and then it started to recoup and then it was in c19 which is 18 months later and it tanked and recouped and yeah. it began to tank heading into this commander set and it's beginning to recoup because it was not in this commander set so it's been about an 18 month cycle of uh you know, recuperating back up to a four to five dollar card, and that's where I expect it to be. But I expect this to take less than eighteen months. I expect this to be probably two to three months, and then we'll be back up towards a four or five dollar card. When I was looking at this originally, you could actually arbitrage copies from TCG players straight to Card Kingdom for cash dollars. That's where they were on this card right then and there. Um, CK yep. had a low buy order number by the time I caught it, which is twenty four. Usually, they're, if, if something's super hot, they'll buy infinite. So, obviously, the demand is not terribly great. But when they're buying for more than TCG market, it's generally a pretty solid investment. The market was about $1.58 when I looked into it. It's right around the same. And I feel super comfortable moving in on a fair number of these. You yeah. Know, I have throwing $20 at uh, 11 or 12 copies of these plus shipping is definitely a, a no-brainer for me at this point looking at this price graph and seeing how quickly and how well it does rebound and it is rebounded successfully every time. Yeah. I don't feel like I need to bring up the EDH rec numbers for this because it is solid. It is very solid. Um, and it, it is, it's also not the kind of thing that I see them printing in a core set again. No. Uh, obviously, that was you know the first printing, but I don't think they're going to do it again. And as long as it sticks to supplemental product, I think 
each time the floor just gets higher and higher despite the reprint. Yeah, absolutely. So. The, the one thing I didn't expect when I was looking at Rex was uh, I thought this would be in a more dedicated set of shells. What I was finding was this is in goofy stuff like Atali, the red uh, dinosaur from Ixalan that whenever it attacks, hmm. everybody reveals a top card of their library and you can play it. Is it print? Okay, like, interesting. Yeah, uh, decks like that were actually towards the top of the list on Wreck. It wasn't just hmm. Brago, King Eternal, and Kokusho uh, competitive decks yeah. on Wreck. Like, this yeah. is a card that, because it costs less financially than Rings of Brightheart and works a bit differently, people people play it. I'll, I'll bring yeah, up Wreck. that's Rex. fair. So you see uh, Atali, Primal Storm, Kokusho, Ilharg is up here. Like, there are all these creatures that just get okay. value in combat, right? Yeah. But a lot of these are a lot more competitive than others. Uh, yeah, Brago. Yeah. Um, so uh, the fact that this is played in some really goofy stuff is, is also kind of appealing to me because if if it's just a spike card like rings and it worries me a little bit, but when it's just more widely adopted, yeah, by Johnny's like and Timmy's, bam, um, I'm all for that. They drive the market. There it is. All right. So for my pick, I went uh, with the season again. We're getting into modern season. So I took a look at, of course, mana bases because they're one of the most solid things to get into. Mm -hmm. And I noticed a lot of discussion on like Reddit and some of the Facebook groups and some of the forums out there. People are talking about scape shift and cutting quantities of stomping ground in favor of upping cinder glade. So I took a look at the price and I noticed that the normal one is low sub a dollar right now yep the most interesting thing i noticed is that the expedition just had its all-time low last month so at the time the low was 23.95 it's currently sitting at around 25 26 dollars so this card has great playability going for it for the season mm -hmm. it's a fetchable dual land and especially at the price point it's at for like just the normal version at about a dollar I don't see how you can lose money on it because of EDH. So it's another one that throwing like 20 bucks at, picking up a few of, and just sitting on to see what happens, perfectly fine. Yep. Me, I'm actually going for the expedition personally. Uh, probably only going to pick up like four to six. But at that point, I feel like within the next year, I'll be able to profitably buy list it. Because there's no more BFZ sealed laying around it gts or southern no. don't know about acd or anyone else but that's gone uh this stuff was peak opened so a lot of it made its way onto the market they're not going to see any more of it and the stuff that's out there that continues to be out there is going to get played and knocked into worse condition and collectability yep people love this stuff it's just like when i mentioned divert as a pick when people start finishing this off they're going to go for the low-hanging fruit first mm-hmm expose the low-hanging fruit so for the eternal players that want to pimp out pick up the there expo you if your market's a lot more edh players that might want to break into modern or something like that pick up the pack card whether it be you know the commander set bfz itself whatever the case throw 20 bucks at it i don't think there's any way you lose yeah now uh as somebody that played uh red green scape shift for long enough to know what you can and can't cut out of the deck at least one of those is going to remain that's yeah. kind of why the price is suppressed on the regular one not just because there's bfc and super uh, highly open but if this was a four yeah. of we'd see probably a three dollar price tag on this i know that's not earth shattering to hear like oh i just would have like doubled up but it's the yeah. fact that you're you can get by with one right now and you're fine uh but that card will remain a staple you know hands yep. down we have in modern is it uh, a new lightning rift in the that rare lion uh, yeah it's a uh, lightning helix but yeah uh, uh, on a creature when you cycle there is the red enchantment out of modern horizons that gives you the ability to cycle lands natively yeah so we have a handful of red finishers now for a uh, an astral slide style deck we have a lot of pieces of the puzzle so to speak but we don't have a good enough metagame to play these decks in yet mm -hmm. so there does always exist that opportunity uh red white astral slide was great in standard up until mirrodin and then a little ways into uh oh sorry 
Through Fifth Dawn, Tooth and Nail. Yeah, so right, right before Kamigawa came out. And yeah. basically, Red was cut because all it did was offer Astral Slide at that point. Oh, no, sorry, Lightning Red, which is not good enough in the format, and brought in Eternal Witness, which is eminently yeah. splashable with the lands that we have afforded to us in Modern, especially with eight uh, multicolored lands that cycle, four of them being the Triomes in yeah. Teamer Colors. Or, uh, so you can do that, or... You, you have eight between Cinderglade and the green-white one, however you want to slice it, and then another eight on top of or 12 with the uh, single land producing cycling lands. There always exists that opportunity. So yeah. at any point in time, if anything like that picks up, this is a card that goes with it as well. So moving in for a dollar and some, you know, A+. plus. I wish this card would pop in Pioneer. I've been sitting on a bunch just kind of waiting. But yeah i don't i do not regret picking them up put it that way no and that's the other thing is i think scapeshift will continue to get like lands that do dumb things are going to be printed again mm -hmm. scapeshift will be relevant again in pioneer yeah. it's only a matter of time yeah there could if the modern format ever slowed down enough where you could actually stand to play more cinder glades than you do stomping grounds in that deck then you're yeah. going to see a flip on that but we have to wait for modern to slow down this is a card that it's kind of like on the outside looking in to get more than one copy in a deck or more than two copies right now. Yeah. But it has the opportunity. And for that, I think getting in on, on the set version is also another no-brainer. Like, same thing with Stronic Resonator. Like you said, you throw $20 with the sit on a bunch of them. I don't think there's a way you really lose unless they just keep printing yeah. it into the ground. But True. I don't know. I, I like it. I think it's solid. Yeah. A+. Plus, all around. Um... I think that's gonna cover it for this week. The that's it for me. Yeah, the set lifestyle life cycle took a lot out of me this week. I'm trying to track all yeah. that stuff down and make that make that image. But you know, thanks for sticking with us. And I'm sure again we'll reference this as we move through uh, Corian as we get any additional information. And you know, uh, by delaying this, we got some great stuff like the Legacy yeah. Leagues coming down. That announcement. Um, what was the other one? Got, Jumpstart got pushed back. We got that announcement yep. today. That's now a uh, June 17th or something like that. So I'm sure we'll have more than enough to talk about next week, and we'll see you there. Sounds good, guys. Catch you then. See you.